I have had imams being blackmailed. I mean, I've heard about them and I've seen them myself. You, s- you initially said you've had imams blackmailed. Uh, um, when I said I had, 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 <laughs> I've, had, I've, had I've had conversations. Yeah, yeah. I've had conversations yeah. with imams. Yeah, you heard who, it here who, first. Who, who be, yeah. Imams are today, unfortunately, mm. whether you like it or not, this pod, podcast is going to go out. And uh, people need to know this. Imam to, imams today, today, mm. as we treat them and as we keep them and as we manage them are slaves. Yeah, what what irritates me was that again you had this you know lay person who's just converted to Islam. Mm. People are asking fatwas. Was are you serious? Uh, uh, What's your yeah. opinion, sister? On you it's, know, yeah, you know, everyone assumes, right? Number one, everyone assumes Khalijis are all rich, and number two is like you know they're very expensive. No, right? they don't have to be rich. So, they yeah. are expensive. Yeah, they're expensive. They're high maintenance. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, there's some people that demand a lot of money, right? Mm. So, like Fareed, I understand. <laughs> no, that's not true. He doesn't Khalid. demand. He doesn't, you know, it's like Khalid. you know, you know, who's gonna clip this out if I say you demand a lot of money. You know, who's gonna clip that out, right? Every kafir, every mu'tadir, yeah. even some folks who are like upon yeah. I mean, whatever I'm upon, yeah. but they have issues with me. They're gonna clip that out. <laughs> So, but that's completely not true. Alhamdulillah. Uh-huh. Um, uh, it may be true. He's a Khaliji, so these people are expensive. <laughs>
yeah like, as as these these are like religious leaders right so i wouldn't yeah. say just an imam maybe like you're talking about speaker the imam, teachers speakers you know what I mean? yeah exactly chaplains apparently yeah yeah category on there yeah yeah not really sure what that is but yeah so um what do you, would you concur would you say that's like the number one most prevalent issue that you're dealing with is religious doubts um i'm not too sure about that in the western world that is the case yeah to yeah. to some extent the, so the top two were understanding religious doubts and mm-hmm. contemporary issues facing the youth youth yeah they they can be both intertwined yeah uh, doubts can lead to other issues yeah okay so there are students muslim students going to universities and colleges they get exposed to doubts they get exposed to doubts online mm-hmm. if they are just uh, watching anything and everything mm-hmm. they might bump into videos produced by neo atheists and christian missionaries and outright islamophobes mm-hmm. and they simply don't know how to respond to those points so that then then the religious leaders should be aware they should have some basic knowledge mm-hmm. as to how uh, they, they must respond to these doubts because most imams let's say if we mean by religious leaders imams most imams are actually not trained in dealing with doubts of philosophical nature or doubts of historic nature or doubts of mm. uh, even theological nature they're not trained to respond to doubts shubahat they're not trained their theological training is very straightforward they go through um you know islamic literature basically the arabic language and basic books of hadith and tafsir and um fiqh so yeah. they are not necessarily trained so this is a separate area mm. where you can train the imams and the duaat and the leaders and the chaplains and the influentials and the academics into how they can respond to doubts yeah my personal experience is that um the best thing to do is to indulge in interfaith dialogue one of the best ways to train imams and muslim leaders is to indulge in interfaith dialogue and study um comparative religion mm. that way they will learn how to debate uh, other religions and uh, address doubts they may raise yeah and uh, this is how they can learn practically speaking mm. you can't just always learn from books well, what are your thoughts for me specifically on imams learning about doubts yeah like uh, two things twofold one is do you feel that you also concur that this is probably one of the biggest issues um that that are, that's uh i guess would be facing an imam and are they equipped i think um so that none was mentioning that it seems that they're not equipped to deal maybe as well with the doubts and uh maybe even the youth I think first of all um there's no field called shubuhat. Yeah. It's not an actual field. Yeah. People that get into different fields they have an idea of how to deal with certain doubts. Um but of course it's it is very important and, and again is there is are it, books written by scholars in the past. Yeah, the, but, the but for shubhat and uh, right, but, but it's not. Like, it's not like a specific field. Like you can't go to university. Really, and, and, yeah, yeah, and it could be different by based on the from, time, right? From time to time, time yeah. from yeah, different yeah. times, people had different doubts, yeah. different con- contentions and concerns. Yeah. But now the onslaught is too uh, intense. Yeah, the onslaught of doubts, especially uh, in the youth. is too intense because of the social media phenomenon mm. we cannot ignore it our leaders should also be trained on social media mm. yeah they should be they should be visible on social media so they don't know, so they so they know what what's going on if they don't know what the hell is going on then how they're going to deal with it yeah yeah so they need to know what what is going you know, on social media is really time consuming if you see some of the schedule especially with imams like i know some of the schedule that the imams have like you have your own family and then uh all the duties that you have and your your phone is always ringing uh trying to establish a presence in the masjid then we gotta, should have dedicated you gotta, like then start posting on like twitter and stuff like that's no, like, we, the last thing we, on their we mind. should have dedicated people yeah. for that then. yeah 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 no 100% mm-hmm. um 
how do you think we can train or um because you're saying there's no field right that says okay this is the field of uh you know doubts or deconstructing doubts so um how, how do we uh educate and train religious leaders specifically it would be interesting if like there was some sort of a course or book that says how to deal with the top 100 most common questions that are brought up yeah you know that would be that would be interesting yeah um and like imams could familiarize with themselves with these topics because most people aren't going to read the stuff but mm. an imam should have an idea mm. of how to do yeah. what do you think absolutely yeah yeah what would you say is would i think be... in the west uh dr sayed yeah i must insist in in western nations in western lands uh imams should be trained specifically to mm. deal with specific problems of the youth because if you bring an imam from a village or a, from from a religious seminary in Egypt mm. Pakistan or India or Bangladesh yeah. and you put them in imam uh, as an imam in a masjid just to lead prayers and do janaza and do nikah this is not much of an imam he's not mm. he's not a solution he's actually part of the problem okay yeah. he doesn't understand the language of the youth he doesn't know what challenges they may be facing at school college university yeah. on the street on social media yeah so an imam should be someone highly educated for the western world yeah. we should have intellectuals as, as imams or imams as intellectuals mm. okay you can't just have someone trained on basic islamic theological uh, requirements and and then put them on the member although i think that is important right we can of course yeah. i mean that's a given i'm saying yeah. i'm saying that has to be done yeah an imam must know how to be an imam Mm. An imam must know how to get people married, how to do janaza, mm. how to teach Quran, how to do religious classes. Mm. On top of that, an imam in a masjid, let's say in the US or in Australia mm. or in Canada or in Germany, for example, should be someone who has at least gone through a bachelor's level or a master's level. Or do you think that, that should be diversified? Like if you have somebody who's doing the traditional religious duties within a masjid, you need somebody else assigned to deal with not necessarily no you no? can have both together yeah i've seen people you can I've have seen, it all the complete package oh yes one. i've i've met with people who have yeah. very strong islamic knowledge in islamic sciences mm. and at the same time has academic credentials mm. someone who has a degree in sharia for example let's say from an islamic institution also mm. has a masters in in philosophy masters in history masters in sociology let's say mm. masters in engineering or something like that mm. a person like that is very uh how can beneficial for masajid in the western world mm. but if you just have an imam who's just like a village guy doesn't know english doesn't even speak urdu or arabic or other languages mm. i don't i think you're wasting your time you're wasting your money you're wasting your children mm. yeah this is a serious problem yeah. that needs to be uh that needs to be. and the reason why these kind of imams come to uh, come to be imams is because of the mentality of the management of the masajid mm. the management of these islamic schools and masajid is mainly made of elderly uncles who were born in india pakistan egypt or or iraq places like that mm. they came to these western nations very late in their life okay and they ended up exactly. making decisions for their future generations that do not necessarily cater for their needs mm. so this is my 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 concern that that needs to change now in the western world massage should be run by people who are if not born here at least educated here okay who understand the culture uh who understand the challenges who understand the the needs of uh, the youth or the next gen- next generation mm Uh, feel free to have some t- uh yeah live fuck yeah. all right is in here no, but it should be in here <laughs> <laughs> well you can pour it in there <laughs> you can put it in there if you want <laughs> all right so before i make this thing Okay so there's another I think Freed has lost interest in those grapes so can I can just leave them yeah. here please uh, <laughs> can, can, can yeah. we bring someone Sorry. to feed the stuff the grapes <laughs> This is the most random unorganized uh, organic 
Yeah. This is okay. Eating and munching pe- pe- and drinking podcast. Pe- um, people I'm should not understand. Complaining. People should understand. Don't this edit. Is, Just leave it like th- that. This is like in the middle of the night. You know what I mean? After a week of like intense dawa, and it's actually even longer for uh, Ustad Adnan, right? Like it's. And clearly we've yeah. lost our minds. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. subhanAllah. Okay, so there's another one here rank order of challenges and obstacles hmm. with quotes, right? So, they put the, like the top 10 challenges. Okay, for Islamic leaders. Um, okay. First one is lack of community interest. Mm. Second one is overwhelming obligations. Three is lack of funding for programs. Four is difficult board members. Five is uh, managing family obligations. Six is lack of personal compensation. I think we were talking about personal compensation. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So, um, you know, there's some people that demand a lot of money, right? Mm. So... Like Fareed. No, I just, <laughs> no, that's not true. He does not give It's like, <laughs> you know, you know who's going to clip this out? If I say you demand a lot of money, you know who's going to clip that out, right? <laughs> every kafir, <laughs> every muqtada. <laughs> Even some folks who are like upon, yeah. the, whatever I'm upon, yeah. but they have issues with me, they're going to clip that out. <laughs> so, but that's completely not true. Alhamdulillah. Uh-huh. Um, um, it may be true. He's a Khaliji, so these people are expensive. Yeah, you know, everyone assumes, right? Number one, everyone assumes Khalijis are all rich. And number two is like, you know, they're very expensive. No, right? they don't have to be rich. So, they yeah. are expensive. Yeah, they're expensive. They're high maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, I'll let you respond, you know, <laughs> to that. Um, Gone are the days when a Khaliji <laughs> would be happy with a tent and a camel. Adnan's <laughs> just ruined any, like... Chance of a cordial discussion today. <laughs> it's a war. It's like the flags of war have been raised. Uh, okay, then seven is counseling uh, community members. Eight is lack of adequate physical space. Mm-hmm. Okay, so like um, lack, that is uh, the quote here is lack of appropriate space to run programs, no gym for the youth, for example. Mm-hmm. So I want you, can you address any of these, like your comments on any of these challenges and obstacles? And um, they're any all thoughts true. or insights. They're true, hundred percent. They're, they're all, true. And and, uh, and, and and I would like to. He he was asking me the question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> asking me the question. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. Please, please go ahead. So yeah, if you want to address Thank any you. address any one of them. Thank you. Can you please repeat the question? <laughs> um, there you go. <laughs> Hence my involvement. So, <laughs> your thoughts on any of these challenges and obstacles, and then you know any uh, insight and so, solutions. So right? these are, these are obstacles that are mentioned by the imams themselves that yes. they have an issue with because oh yeah okay, community lacks interest and in yeah la- the number one is lack of community interest yeah, yeah. number two is overwhelming obligations Sheikh, please stop destroying the furniture and three is lack of funding for programs uh difficult board men- members uh five is a managing family obligation six is lack of personal compensation Seven is uh, counseling community members. Eight is lack of adequate physical space. So any one of these, if get your comments on. Lack of community interest is a big thing. It, yeah. it's, so this isn't like an imam being whiny. It's a reality. Yeah. And um, this is not, this is, okay, so the imam can play a role in getting the community more involved and more interested, definitely. Yeah. But this is a, this is an issue with people themselves. It's, a, it's an issue with, yeah, you, you, know, you see, I don't believe that it's the imam's job to get the community interested in the deen. If you're someone who believes in Allah and the last day and the judgment, you should be interested in the deen no matter what. You don't need someone to say, come Habibi, let's uh, come watch uh, sh- shorts, YouTube shorts and TikToks uh, that have like happy reminders in the end. And then they're like, yeah, I like the deen now. La, you should be interested from <laughs> the moment you know about an afterlife. Mm. You know, the thing is, is and you know what? Yeah, sorry, sure. Sheikh Farid, are you done? Mm-hmm. Uh, I I think this culture of having an imam specifically dealing with janaza, talaq, five daily prayers, adhan, even this is I don't know Islamically if, if it's. Uh, I mean, I'm going to raise a very controversial question now. Mm. I mean, imam as a profession. Yes. Do we find a precedent of it? In the early Islamic generations, like Not Imam as a, as a, as a, yeah, someone paid, given a camel or a car or or or, or a ride, let's say a horse. Well, wasn't this provided by the Islamic 
like the work for like but i feel it has become it has become like a like an industry in in particular when Please it explain. comes to islamic yeah islamic institutions that educate muslims on islamic sciences one of the things they have in their mind is that this person when he qualifies as a scholar or as a sheikh he will just take a position in a mosque he will just become an imam i i feel the way things are going now the way culture has uh, what it has become it's counterproductive that's one of the reasons why we have all these challenges doubts and youth youth not having any connection to the mosque because we have some some guy sitting there who's getting paid um his salary and uh, why would he be interested in the in the development of the youth when he knows his salary for $5000 or $3000 or $4000 is coming every month mm. and he's just going to do his ticking the box so you should I have be commission i have le- no not even commission <laughs> like i think this should be done by the community yeah like there should be people in the community who should be be able to lead the salah who can do janaza and talaq and yeah. uh, and and do But all you know this. that's not really realistic because people nowadays even just to get them to come and listen to something is very difficult but to have somebody dedicated i don't know maybe in the uk it's different but here in canada if you if you rely on volunteers you're just asking for instability yes you know what i mean same. we have the same problem in the uk yeah we have the same problem everywhere in the world hence the profession of the imam i mean this is why imam has become a a professional pastime people now it's it's an industry what do you think is it like you know we saw, we saw some of what the imams are making so it's definitely yeah yeah and lucrative yeah well the, you have a spectrum right like you yeah. have i think the average is 10000 per month i think if you are part of a decent community Right. Um I think that's towards the higher end if I recall correctly. Is it towards the higher I end? I think it was towards the higher end. So it's yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know what I mean? Not in the UK. Not in, in the in UK. In the UK, imams don't get paid that much no yeah. way. Yeah. No. I think the US Muslims in the US have spoiled the imams. Mm. Right. And they and they get a lot of benefits by the way, like sometimes they'll get free housing and Well, that's look. Yeah. No, look. But look, but, let, but I'm let, saying let, in, let terms the, the balance. Uh, in terms Someone of the balance. In terms of the compensation package. The, if there is a special imam yeah. If you no have someone no highly qualified, yeah, yeah. So if you have someone highly qualified yeah. in Islamic sciences, highly active, mm. highly desired, highly popular among the youth, mm. someone who drives the youth, someone who actually mm. plays the leadership role, someone who establishes dawa, mm. who establishes teams, who goes out and establishes dawa tables, who drives the community, who is truly an imam. Okay, okay an, but I have a question mean? for you: Sorry? Is is an imam but, just uh, an employee? No. Yeah, that's the point. That's the point. This is exactly where the problem is. Mm. If an imam is just a slave hired by the committee of the masjid, that doesn't know better and they dictate to imam what he ought to ought to and what he got uh, what he ought to and what he ought not to do. Mm. Okay, when the community uncles and you know babas and chachas and mamas when they become the committee members and they are the 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 string pullers or they are the ones who are managing things if they start to dictate to imams that this is a slave this is not an imam mm. this is just someone who is there for money he just wants to get paid every month and just keep his mouth shut keep his head down and i have had imams being blackmailed i mean i've heard about them and i've seen them myself you, you initially said you've had imams blackmailed uh, um, when i said i had had, <laughs> I've, had, had. i've had i've had conversations yeah, yeah. I've had conversations yeah. with imams yeah you who, heard it here first who, who've been yeah. blackmailed for the visa Oh. Yeah, they were brought in. So then if they don't tow the line, they're going to be Yeah, deported. they will be sent back. Oh wow. To India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, wherever they were mm. they were brought or oh, Egypt. And it's happened. Wallahi, it has happened in places where Egyptian imams lost their visa mm. because they were doing dawa and oh, they were not really? sitting inside the masjid. Mm. I have dealt with a case. I'm not going to say where and who and mm. when. Yeah. Uh but I've dealt with a case with an where an Egyptian Imam trained at Al Azhar mm. wanted to do dawa and okay. he was bringing a large number of people to Islam in a country his visa was cancelled by um, the masjid administration or the government uh not the government by the people who were managing but why why would they do that doesn't make sense because the masjid didn't want uh problems 
like putting problems in like, the Muslims? Like uh, too many people are accepting Islam, so we oh, might okay. cause uh, some uh, <laughs> some some problem. Yeah. So so look, the point is, imams are today, unfortunately, mm. whether you like it or not, this pod podcast is going to go out, and uh, people need to know this. Imam to imams today, today, mm. as we treat them and as we keep them and as we manage them, are slaves. Mm. They're not independent. They're not free. And they are doing it for money. Most of them are doing it for money. Mm. They don't have any interest in da'wah or the spread of Islam. And the reason, I'm not saying they're insincere or they are monafics. I'm saying the way they are managed and treated, mm. they are reduced to becoming slaves and just working for money. What are your thoughts for you? I think the more you give uh, an imam or you give anyone that's doing anything religion related, yes, the less they're doing it for the sake of their God and their religion. Yeah. It doesn't have to be even be like strictly Islamic. And uh, my hope for the Imams and anyone who's involved in religion um, is to take as, as little as possible so that on the Day of Judgment, when they're asked, why did you do this and this and this deed? They could get away with saying, I did it for you, Ya Allah. Mm. Because in most cases it's going to be, yeah, I did it for you, Ya Allah, but you know, Fifty uh, percent was actually for the uh, compensation that I was re receiving. Mm. Uh, that's just the reality, Annie. The more you get, the more it tampers with your intentions. You know, there's two sides of this. I, I agree. You know, and I think it's like we, you, we can't be, you know, black and white on this issue mm. as the uh, almost as much as we would like to, right? Because I've seen imams, like good imams, good imams. Um, knowledge everything and they've been abused they've been abused by the you know by the community and then you have also that dynamic where you have people on the board that it's like treating them like an employee like you got to toe the line whatever our opinion or our policy is there's an imam that i know personally where he was not getting along with the board and the house um, that he uh, lived in, the it was divided into basically like um, uh, essentially almost like two apartments. So the top one, uh, he would be with his family. The bottom one was actually the caretaker of the masjid, mm. would live in the bottom one. And they basically, um, because he wasn't towing the line, and he has a contract, right? obviously Canada, things are illegal. You can't just fire somebody like that or whatever. So they started just making his life miserable. Mm. And that uh, caretaker would start like, whatever instructions he was given, started cutting off the heat. This is Canadian winter, so it's very difficult. Started cutting off the heat, started, you know, messing around with like, um, you know, the, the water or, you know, stuff like that. Like really, you know, harassing him and his family. You know what I mean? We and this is like somebody, a person of knowledge yeah. and, they're using a kind of these third rate techniques, right? We had but then it's like you have the, like, I don't know if there needs to be a, some kind of body that oversees everything because on the flip side, there's been like a person who was, who was an imam, okay? But also at the same time, you'd think, okay, this is gonna be better because he almost ran the mushes. It's almost like he was the president of the shura, okay? So you had that's almost like this dual role he milked that masjid for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he ended up doing some um, pretty illegal stuff uh, and immoral stuff. Like, you know, there's some abuse involved and he's in jail right now. And it's scandalized. Of course, non-Muslims are going to love to publish the details mm. of what he did and how he did it, right? Mm. So here is a chance of a person who was an imam and also like in, in imam in the sense that he was the leader mm. and he just completely, there's no oversight mm. and just completely betrayed everybody's trust, yeah. did so much damage, right? So, you know, how do we, like in this type of wild west, how do you kind of consult there, like- There has to be a system. There yeah. has to be a process. Um, we need to come up with a system that uh, ensures that we have the right people to manage the masjid and we have the, have the right people to run 
Obida Imams of the Masjid. Should we have a minimal qualification 100%. for people to be yeah. like in the Shura? Like a, yeah, a minimal a qualification of Deen and yeah. you know managerial skills or some, or some 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 sort of dawah background. Yeah, some sort of project management background. Yeah. some sort of uh, because Imam, what do we want from Imam? Is the question as a community, as Muslims? Mm. Nowadays, Masjids they don't want an Imam who is a leader. Uh, kind of person. Mm. They want an imam who is timid, who is down to earth. Just listen to the co- listen to the committee members, mm. the committee of the masjid, and just get bullied. Get, gets bullied and just does his thing, and that's it. Mm. Just stay quiet, stay down, don't talk too much, don't do too too many fiery khutbas, okay, things like that. Uh, this is exactly what the situation is right now. Yeah, and this is not only in the Western world. I mean the. The, the the entire Muslim Ummah is going through this problem. Mm. Uh, it has become a slave program. Will we? Where well, we, in the Gulf, right? Everything has to be approved, right? Many well, that, that's a different correct? matter. That's a different yeah. issue. I haven't. That, I ha- I've, that, actually, that, I've actually. I, I've actually. I've actually um, seen cases in which um, imams in Friday sermons have said things that went against government policy. Yeah, and lived to. to see another day and weren't arrested and came back the next week and you know, there there was some freedom uh, yeah yeah there of course there are cases where it would not go that way but yeah um i've seen i've seen cases where it was fine hmm. this is not maybe like a blanket across the board maybe no more, there, these are exceptions yeah. yeah i agree with sheikh farid i've hmm. seen these cases myself yeah. these are exceptions if you go to two thousand i mean we have two to three thousand masajid in uh in the UK, mm. overwhelming majority of them have imams who are slaves. Okay. Absolutely. I don't hesitate to say this. I know this is going to come back to me. Is that I, one of the reasons why you think maybe um, the du'at now, especially the online du'at who have like a little bit more freedom. They have more say, sway. Like yeah, maybe yeah. people have gravitated more towards them because they're like, you're more authentically free and maybe representing our own thoughts. Rather and than you're dealing with and they've naturally problems. kind of migrated away from mm-hmm. the imams because of this. What do you think? You, you have this rhetoric that uh, suggests that every imam that's receiving some sort of compensation from, of course, uh, speaking of Islam, Islamic countries, uh, Muslim countries, um, they're being influenced by the governments themselves. Mm. So they have been, what's the word? Compromised, yes, they have been compromised, and uh, again, this is a, as a, yeah, we've mentioned earlier, it's a generalization, and uh, from what I've seen, I've seen imams conflict with government policies. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's do. unfair to say necessarily that the most of the imams are compromised. That would be an unfair statement to say. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. There's definitely some people that are compromised. Yeah. Um, by the way, any, even people who are on the internet, they're not receiving anything from any government, but they, they are technically the slaves of their audience. They give That's their audience true. what they want to see and want yeah. to hear. Um, and especially, especially if they're receiving some sort of monetary compensation from their audience. Yeah, Ham- Hamza calls them uh, algorithm prostitutes. Mm. Algorithm prostitutes. Yeah. But again, to be fair, not everyone's like that. Yeah, of course. There are sure. du'at who are actually uh, they, they 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 face trouble because of their content mm. because they're speaking the haq, they're yeah. speaking yeah. the truth. They are representing the Muslim community, and they are re- representing their concerns and mm. their political issues. So they they actually deal with issues head on. And mm. they f- they face trouble because of that. So while this may be true uh, in in cases where people are slaves to their audiences, but there are other Muslim activists online, the reason they are popular is because they speak in the Ak, and the youth is more inclined to them is because they find with them what they don't find in the masjid. Mm. The masjid is not inspirational. The masjid does not provide a ground for them to be inspired or to have any affinity with the, with the Islamic civilization. Because mm-hmm. the Imam is a slave, he's so boring and so dead that he just leads the he leads his prayer, just goes mm-hmm. back to his room, goes back yeah. to his house, comes back at the whole time, then it comes back to come comes back at asr time. Doesn't talk to people much, 
doesn't do any youth programs necessarily. Again, I'm not talking about exceptions. Mm. I'm talking about the norm. Go to any masjid in North America or in Britain or in Germany mm. or in Australia uh, uh, or in South Africa. That's the you know, there was a really sad video in Ramadan. I don't know if it's this past Ramadan or the Ramadan before where in, there was a masjid in Toronto where it was being filmed. So every like Taraway, there'd be filming like a small reminder. And so like one of the young imams that was hired like to, to lead the Tarawih, and he was hired there as an imam, he just let it loose. He said, I'm just saying this now. And there's a reason why I'm saying this because I have for the past three months tried to meet with the board and they refused to meet with me. So I'm just saying this. It's like we need to start doing, and he literally was asking for very simple things. We need to start doing programs for the youth. I need support to be able to do this. Many youth are coming to me and asking. So his, it's like demands were unreasonable. He was very respectful when he was saying all of this. And guess what happened to him? He was fired. He was fired. Because hmm. he was a slave. You know what I mean? He's a contractor. Yeah. He's a contractor. Yeah. So this is the problem. The Muslim community is self-inflicting. Mm. We are self-inflicting without realizing what we're doing. And then we cry that our children are not listening to us. They are on the street. They have mm. doubts. They are apostatizing. They are on drugs. Uh, because you massage it, they've become temples. Mm. Temples of prayer, rituals. Yeah. You have very rituals without spirit. Again, I'm not talking of exceptions. Mm. There are great masjids. I can name them. Like, for example, we have great masjid in London. Yes. You know, where people in large numbers accept Islam. Lewisham, we have a masjid in Lewisham. Yeah. Uh, we have a masjid in Birmingham. We have few masjids in Birmingham. Yeah. Um, okay, in the city of Birmingham. We have good masjids in Manchester as well, in the UK. Um, uh, they're doing youth programs. They do, they do da'wah pro- Look, the, this is the way I see it. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something very basic. Okay. A masjid in the Western world, if that if if a masjid is not organizing dawah programs to non-Muslims, mm. and if the doors of the masjid are not open to non-Muslims and new Muslims, and if there are no specific programs catering for non-Muslims and new Muslims, it's not ideally it's not a masjid. Mm. It's just okay. It's it's a place. It's a it's a place of prayer. It's a musalla. Yeah. Okay. It's a musallah where people come and pray. Musallis pray. Okay. A masjid, technically looking at the model of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet was giving dawah to Christians in Masjid al-Nabawi. Mm. He was sending expeditions. He was sending his letters and and uh, wufud, amul wufud, the year of uh, delegations. Where were these delegations coming and meeting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Mm. Masjid. All of this needs to be considered. Our masjids have just become places of worship. They're not community centers. We're not spreading Islam. We're not yeah. conveying the message of Islam. They're not hubs of da'wah. Imagine Rasulullah sitting in one of the masjids here and he sees all of you guys doing your Jummah, doing your daily salah, doing your maybe Quran classes for children. Mm. And he would think, you guys, are, are you actually my followers? I went to the city of Taif, I got stoned. Yeah. I was strangled almost yeah. to death. My family suffered. I fought battles and wars upon wars. To well, in the West, I, I, have a, I have a question. I'll start with you for it. Like in the West, I get a sense, and then maybe you get your insight on this. I get a sense that a lot of the way that they carry themselves, like policy-wise and procedure-wise, is out of fear. Like they don't want to lose their charitable status. Mm. They don't want to get in trouble with the government or they don't want to get like you know, scandalized somehow. And, um, you know, like, for example, um, I saw that I've seen a change. Like, you would, you could go to the masjid at some point and you could just stay there all night. You could sleep in the masjid, you could stay there all, all night. And many masjid just, they shut that down. Like, no, no, you got to leave. Certain times, like, these are the hours, these are the business hours, and you got to leave. And there's a reasoning for that. You know, they've had, you know, vandalism. Homeless, you, you drugs. Know, and- you have people who, you know, might misuse or whatever. So um, what, do you th- what are your thoughts? Like, is it acceptable? Is it appropriate for them to operate based out of fear? Or should we have a little bit less 
fear and a little bit more hope in utilizing the masjid to its full potential? Well, naturally, it shouldn't be operated out of fear. Um, yeah, at the, at the end of the day, the main... Because, you know, there are masjid here, mm. just so you know, they've lost their charitable status or mm. they've been affected legally. Like, for example, they'll bring a speaker and that speaker I mean, could be controversial and then all of a sudden they've lost their charitable status, right? So, yeah, and then they become that hyper... It, that, and, and you know what happens? Charitable status, I'm not following. So, a lot of the ways these masajid, they operate is through donations, mm, right? Mm, and so yeah. they have a charitable status to give people tax receipts. Okay. You know what I mean? So then yeah. that's how they get a lot of their, you know, their, their funding to okay. do that, right? So um, if you lose that, you kind of lose a big portion. And then not only that, uh, the, you can avoid paying. If you're a re registered charity, you yourself as an entity don't pay as much taxes. Mm. You know what I mean? So financially, it becomes very difficult to survive if you were to lose that status, right? And um, and so a lot of the decisions that are made are based upon that. And what happens is that it's almost like an, a masjid will be made an example of to basically send a warning shot to the other massages. And then all the other massages will just like toe the line. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So that's kind of the phenomenon that happens. Mm. So, you know, what are, what, what are your... Um, thoughts on that i've never been in that situation i think yeah i would like to assume that those on the boards would know best mm -hmm. i've seen folks be like i have seen people say no we don't do social media because if we do social if we do social media we might get into trouble mm -hmm. i've seen that it seems a bit extreme yeah but i have seen that um because they've seen cases like the ones that you've mentioned mm -hmm. I'm, I'm referring to back in the middle east of course yeah yeah, it's it's a. I'd like to believe that those in the boards have an idea of what's best. Mm -hmm. I'd like to. Yeah. What do you What are your thoughts on that? Um, there has to be a balance. Yeah. There has to be a balance between fear and right action. So how do we overcome fear? Practically speaking, we get lawyers involved. Mm. Okay. We train our imams on law what is legal, what is not legal, what they can say, what they can't say. Activities should be uh, in light of law. I mean, they should be legal, yeah. law abiding. So all of this can be sorted out. There has to be a will to do it. Yeah. So we can organize ourselves. We can do everything what we want, mm. everything good for the community. Okay, mm. what a masjid they're supposed to be doing. You can do your dawah, you can do your fiery speeches, you can do your classes, mm -hmm. so long as you are trained on law. Yeah. So if you have legal advisors, and which is what a lot of UK organizations are doing, you can learn, learn a lot from the UK uh, Muslim community, because they have gone through a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. They have gone through these challenges, dynamic uh, issues they have faced, and they have now, alhamdulillah, found the way of operating with the government uh, because sometimes these governments are unfair. They're unjust. They unjustly target the Muslim community. Yeah. That has happened in the UK yeah. where the government was unjustly for the last yeah. 20 years, since 9-11, the government, the British government had been targeting the Muslim community unjustly. Yeah. There was a lot of propaganda. There was a lot of fear mongering. Yeah. Like we had this uh, Trojan horse um, fiasco not long ago. And it turned out to be a false flag, completely. Mm. The government officials are lying. Mm. And even the prime minister of the UK was sued. David Cameron was sued by one of our sheikhs. Mm. When I say our sheikhs, uh, he's, mm. mashallah, he's a, he, he's a well-known personality in the UK. Uh, he, he actually sued the prime minister mm. for calling him an extremist in the parliament. Mm. So if we understand the law, study the law, and get active with the law, I think we won't be able to, uh, we won't have fear. Yeah. We won't be bullied by the I, government, I think, by the ministers, or by the council. I think the ultimate uh, objective is to get people, like for them, they want to get to us to be to the level of just self-censorship. We're so afraid we're gonna get in trouble, we're just gonna start so, censoring so, ourselves. and. What I saw, like one of the biggest negative, and you can tell me that you see this in the UK, I don't know if this also happened in, in the Gulf, but what I saw 
is that after 9-11, there was such a big thing of self-censorship, especially, say, with the issue of jihad. Like, we're not even going to talk about it. We're not going to mention any ayat that have jihad in it or anything like that. And then these youth, they're naturally interested. So they started learning about it from inappropriate sources, and they developed their whole understanding of, like, say, the fiqh of that from an inappropriate source. You know what I mean? Which led them down a pretty dangerous path. You know what I mean? So in the end, it came to like actually, have a more destructive effect. Actually, you know? not talking about jihad uh, in its uh, true understanding yeah. can be counterproductive. Yeah. This is what breeds extremism and terrorism because youngsters, when they, when, they don't, when they don't learn the real perspective on jihad, Islamic perspective on jihad from good scholars, yeah. from law-abiding scholars, then what's going to happen is these youngsters are going to go online. They're going to find some ragtag uh, jihad preacher mm. who's going to inspire them to do something stupid. Yeah. And then we have all that, uh, you know, cleaning to do. Yeah. So, so this is why there has to be a balance. Mm. Okay. If you, jihad is in the Quran. It's a noble aspect of Islam. Mm. It means to fight against oppression. It means to stand for justice. It means to defend the poor and the needy. Mm. Okay, this is what jihad means, Islamically speaking. This needs to be taught to youngsters that it has its place, has its rule, its rules, its time, its leadership. Okay, not every ragtag extremist online who is talking about jihad is actually representing jihad. Sometimes we have found cases where some Western governments have planted, uh, you know, spies and people to to actually misguide the youth yeah. that they can end up in the wrong places and they yeah. can build some cases. This has happened. Yeah. You know some of the cases I'm talking about. Yeah. Everyone knows. This happened in the UK and there have, they have been reports, yeah. news channels have reported on this, that there was this involvement, even from the governments, where yeah. they did these covert operations. They managed to inspire or radicalize some youngsters mm. and they ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'd like to mention something, Yanni. On the same topic, but not exactly um, uh, directly answering the question, mm. I've because of um, sometimes there's a lot of suspicion mm. by the youth. Even when uh, jihad is discussed to a degree, um, there there is... Uh, there's a lot of suspicion towards ulama and towards imams and towards mm. re religious leaders in general. Mm. I recall this one brother, very friendly brother, and I ha haven't really been in contact with him ages ago. Um, he said, he said to me once, I believe that um, they're taking jihad away from, you know, separating it from Islam completely. So I said, the, the mosque has, oh, so, so he's, he's saying specifically Surah Tawbah. It's like Surah Tawbah is being eliminated from Islam. So I said, well, you know, there are hundreds of masahif in the masjid and Surah Tawbah is right there. So he said, yeah, it's, it's just the mentality, you know? Um, right, what causes someone to say this? And then I said to him, uh, he, he, uh, he said, "He said, if you want to convince me that there's nothing wrong, uh, the governments are not playing a role in suppressing these ideas, and the Quran, he's saying the, the, the government is suppressing the Quran, mm. then show me an example of the imam of our masjid reciting Surah Tawbah. So I went to the imam of the masjid, and he was like, I recite Surah Tawbah, mm. you know, and, uh, <laughs> and and in Ramadan, uh, like yeah. the whole Quran, I recite the whole, I recite the Quran fully in Ramadan. Yeah. What are you talking about? And when I first asked him the question, he, he the, the, the Sheikh was like this, he was like, هذا مريض. You know, this, <laughs> <is> sick. <laughs> this guy is sick. Why is he saying this? <laughs> because it was an accusation against the Imam himself. Yeah. It was an accusation yeah. against the Imam that he was like selling out, yeah. right? Um, 
that. You, you know, I think that's you're, you make a very good point mm. because people make a false equivalence just because you're not talking about it all the time. You're against it. Right. You know or it's I mean? being that's suppressed. A, right? Yeah, it's being yeah. Su- if you're not talking about or, the, or the, like if that's something on your mind and the imams aren't talking about it as much as it's on your mind, yeah. then there's something wrong. So here, here's the response yeah. of yeah. the brother. Yeah, I, I told. Of course, I didn't say the sheikh says you're a marid. Yeah. Um, I said, hey, bro, the, I spoke to the sheikh, yeah. and the sheikh says um, that he recites uh, Surah Tawbah mm-hmm. in Ramadan. So he said to me, yeah, but that's Ramadan. He's got to he's got to recite it. If he doesn't recite it, then it's going to be really suspicious. Yeah. That's why. He, so there's a way out. You know, if if you're dead set on assuming that the Quran is being suppressed, you know, no answer is going to be sufficient for you. Mm-hmm. No, I agree that you people can make sweeping generalizations, but I know for a fact that in many masajid here, they purposely would avoid talking about this. Another example, let's get off jihad for a second, the Fahasha Mafia. So what they is this? The Fahasha Mafia, right? This colorful, you know the colorful Fahasha Mafia? Oh, yeah. You know, they're very uh, extra fabulous. Okay. So that Mafia, they don't want to talk about it at all, Okay. And Ma- mafia, though, what? Why, why, how are like who specifically are the mafia here? It's just like community the, the leaders who are in general. Promoting the colors, okay. Yeah, so yeah. color promoters. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. LGTV. Right. LGTV. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> they want to sell as many LGTVs as possible. Right. All right. So, um, so they didn't talk about it at all. Yeah. Like I'm talking at all that this is wrong. Mm. Concurrently, it's being hyper promoted in schools and media and television and social media Mm, and everywhere. mm, mm. So there's literally an entire generation Mm. of young Muslims who out of innocence think there's nothing wrong with that. They literally think that there's nothing wrong with that because there's, they've never been told by the religious teachers or imams or anybody that this agenda is incorrect, that this is wrong. Why do we, why are we against it? Because they're so hypersensitive that they're going to get in trouble. Okay, so I have an issue with this idea. I don't believe that um, the imam needs to even be public about this. I think that anyone who's close, to ha- who has any like basic Islamic upbringing or any basic Islamic background would know that this stuff is haram. I don't think that the imam needs to go up on a pulpit. By the way, you'd yeah, be surprised. Like how they're, they're not religious people, accepted. but they're not they're not religious but, people. But yeah. the, to, look, the reality is no, no. But most that, the, the thing kids, is, is for many people, that's the only place where you're going to get any religious knowledge is from the okay. masjid and the imam. Do you right, understand what I'm saying? If, if that person went to the imam yeah. and said, "Hey, is this stuff fine or not?" They yeah. they would know. The, the imam Some of would them are know. so paranoid. They would the pat pro- you down. Like are you the, got a mic the problem, <laughs> doctor. Yeah. Doctor Sayed is highlighting a problem mm. that this discussion is not taking place in the masjid. Yeah. It's taking place at the school. And yeah. Imam is not doing those detailed thick classes uh, on this issue. It doesn't have to so, be detailed. So Yeah. So th- again, the problem is is the way the masajid are uh, managed. If the people running masajid, the management, um, is aware of the situation, if they know what's coming and what's happening, mm-hmm. then the first thing you do is you get the lawyers involved. Okay. Mm-hmm. You go to the lawyers, you ask them, how far can we go? Yeah. What are the boundaries of the law? Mm. And within those boundaries, do as much as you can. Mm. It is laziness. It is lack of concern, lack of... Lack you know, of oftentimes it's not a legal issue. It's, a, it, it's, an, it's like a, it's literally uh, an fear. issue. It's fear, it's fear right? It, it, it's, it's, you know, it's not a, 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 in a real legal courtroom. It's the court of public opinion. So you're going to get like, like a clip that'll be posted on and then it's going to circulate. And that's what they're afraid of because it's happened to a few emails. It's happened so to yeah. a lot of people. Yeah. It's happened to a lot of people. And the reason why uh, this should not happen is because you have to be legally trained on these things. I'll, for example, it happened to me. It happened to me re- recently during this Gaza thing. Mm. I delivered a speech in a masjid. Mm. Clips were taken. I, I, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, I think yeah, I saw something. Clips, yeah. clips were taken from yeah. my entire, I mean, lengthy talk, and they were posted by some Zionist shill mm. on, on Twitter, okay. okay, claiming that I am spreading hatred against the Jewish people. Mm. And I posted the entire talk, mm. and in that very talk, 
I spend like 10 minutes explaining that this is not an issue of the Jewish people. Mm-hmm. We cannot blame the Jewish people for the crimes of few extremists. Mm-hmm. Just like we cannot blame the entire Muslim community for the crimes of few terrorists. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, so I made that point very clear. And when I posted the entire uh, lecture online, everyone was telling these guys to get a life, stop lying, stop doing propaganda. Now, because I was aware that I have to clarify my position because there are people like that out there who will take your clips and do this because yeah. this, is, this is the agenda they have. So that's why you have to be legally aware as to the disclaimers you must make mm. in every single speech. What about now uh, yeah. with the era of AI? Mm. Like, isn't that dangerous? Like, mm. they can literally manipulate your voice and your, your video. Voice yeah, and your voice. Do you fear, yeah. you know? I think fear fear forensic, like, I think the- for, for, Yeah, but then again, you would you won't even get a chance to clarify your position mm. because it'll yeah. be out there and people will believe it. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. So it's dangerous, yes. Usually usually um most people haven't gone that far. Have you seen examples of people going that far blatantly fabricating audios and whatnot? Oh or? yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, mm. give me it's, a, give it's me funny you mentioned this. I, I'm going to share something with you. Yeah. Uh, a conversation be- between uh Donald Trump and Biden uh and this is the conversation they're having I hope I'm, I don't know I think I've lost it yeah. yeah I had it somewhere like like something real or is a spoof sorry like is it, is it supposed to be real uh it it sounds very real when you listen to it you well, okay not- you know I'll give you an example uh of uh of something that people thought was real so they took um a speech of Malcolm X mm. talking yeah. about Palestine mm. and everyone thought it was actual oh, well, like Malcolm X is like even Malcolm X promoted Palestine mm. it's a completely fake speech mm. but it sounds like Malcolm X um and it just everyone was fooled many people were fooled but then this was people, AI this was AI okay yeah and was it was it done with the intention of fooling people or not really <laughs> it seems that way but it's the potential is there now right we know that the technology is getting to that level right so mm. how, how how do you how do you authenticate like when it gets to that level you know it becomes very very difficult or the misinformation can be so sp- far spread wide and then people will just have that image and even if it's corrected you know they might not get the correction yes. right so um, and the thing is anyone who is supportive of th- palestine will have this bias towards believing that Malcolm X mm. said those things. Yeah. And will not care to look into it or double check it or find a source. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, that's that's just how people are. I, I noticed, you know, uh, I have to say, uh, I really like the fact that you've been able to emotionally separate because I think you've called out a few accounts on Twitter saying, like, you know, you've, I think there was some... Um, was it some Norwegian doctor or something like that? Yeah. I, I saw a Swedish. few yeah. Swedish, yeah, something where you were questioning. It seems like who even knows if it's a she, right? You don't know who is behind it. But I think it is. Yeah, I think yeah. it is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for, uh, it's, it's a number of like well-known established accounts that have been taking random pictures of any, like subhanAllah, the, 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 the tragedies in Palestine are sufficient, right? You don't need... random pictures of, of other catastrophes for one to say, oh, by the way, check out this. This is happening in Gaza. You don't need to do that. There's already enough tragedy. Uh, as, There's as, enough authentic yeah. information, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of times, I don't believe a lot of times it's intentional, but when they do this, it just looks bad for the yeah. cause because it looks like the other side is saying, oh, you see, you don't have anything. Mm-hmm. That's why you're fabricating this stuff. Yeah. And uh, it just hurts the cause. It reminds me of like, um, uh, you know, some of the, um, you know, the the scholars of hadith, when they would talk about many of the fabricated hadith were made by good intentions. That's true. They're trying to do, like, get people to do good things, mm-hmm. but then, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. I, I, I don't think that's actually the case. Most fabricated reports. were forged deliberately for evil ends because mm. most most fabricators in the in the second century mostly yeah were known to the muhaddithin and they were known to be evil people people mm. of uh, not only ill, Ill intentions but people of uh, <laughs> unknown aqidas mm. like 
but it was clear that these these are forgers on a massive scale mm. people like javed bin yazid jafi uh, and other uh, you know similar characters who who had forged uh, hadith on mass the point is because they actually were aware of the the the, the report of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mm. someone who is narrating 10000 reports from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and he's forged them mm. do you think he doesn't know man kadhaba alayya mutaammidan fal yatabawwa maq'adahu min an-nar whoever lies upon me deliberately let him yeah. take his place in hellfire yeah. they knew they clearly had uh, messed up beliefs and that's why they they were doing this yeah so i i would agree that a lot of times it's malicious but as as yeah. you've mentioned a lot of yeah. times when someone's narrating about the merits of the quran mm. it's, it's because they want people to read the quran more yeah right yeah. so uh, of course and even by the way sometimes even when someone's narrating stuff about the merits of the quran they're gaining something from it because people are like oh you're you're that person who's the only person that narrates the hadith about the merits of uh, mm-hmm. al-baqara yeah. let, let me come to you and and more people go up to that person to take that ilm from them yeah, yeah. so you have that as well occurring yeah my my, my point was then that phenomenon yeah. is that you know um good intention it, yeah it takes like you know maybe they're spreading this false information about in Palestine and Gaza but it's not based on that authentic but it actually in the end undermines mm. the effort and i think that was the point that you were trying to make on uh twitter with you know talking about some of these accounts you if, know if we don't call it out yeah it looks so much worse when they call it out yeah you know having that mm. muslims ourselves doing it we don't we don't want any Uh, fabrications we need to be accurate with what we report we it, it looks good when we do it because we're we're yeah I mean, we take into these things into consideration we want the truth to be out there that's mm. that's the priority are you talking about those uh communist accounts and uh, left wing accounts no no or? not necessarily communist accounts but there are mu- like uh accounts that claim to be muslim right no. so there's this one i guess it's a swedish doctor yep. or so so she claims to be a swedish doctor and then um you know i think for your question some is she white? some, some is, back is she white yep yeah so well, she muslim, questioned some of her her, her no, story w- 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 look muslims have this post colonial syndrome yeah. where they think every white person talking about islam that's actually muslim. you know what yeah, yeah. Yeah. you're you're bringing up something very interesting hmm. there's a lot of very good looking uh white people on twitter that have converted and have all of a sudden had like a Blown huge, up blown up crazy yeah. following right? alhamdulillah today i've converted to islam that's all they gotta say yeah 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 it's like alhamdulillah today took my shahada and yeah. they become heroes overnight they're yeah. actually which is, which is, they're actually more influential than major ulama yeah. just by saying that one line yeah 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 and and look and it could be it could literally and, be some brown to, guy to, in to, india to, no to yeah. be fair <laughs> yeah, if an african <laughs> if an african from tanzania or yeah. malawi or ghana made a video that i have accepted islam today mm. I believe it wouldn't be as much a big deal as it would be with a white person with American accent or someone let's yeah. say speaking posh British accent mm-hmm. it would get viral and this is because we have this post colonial syndrome yeah you know the, the, it is a big problem in the muslim community to this day unfortunately it, it exists yeah there. there was a latino girl about i think like 4 years ago or something okay that converted is like an emotional shahada where she's like crying and stuff she like that she probably got a thousand proposals Oh, that's uh, and yeah, he, that's, yeah, that's he, an it goes without that. saying, that's right? Another, <laughs> yeah, there are too many brothers willing to sacrifice them okay. themselves. Sister, mashallah, you know. So, so you know, yeah. I can see the piety. You know. So, so what happened next was she immediately built her account by doing that. Yeah, it seems to be a sincere person. I'm not saying she's yeah. sincere. Yeah. Yeah. sincere. Yeah. But what happened? Um, she, she had, I don't know, like 50k or something followers. Yeah. Mainly because of that, just her shahada, bro. Yeah, yeah. And, and then what happened was. Um, a short time later, girl became Shia. Oh, and and what, they wait oh, for we that. We have a worse case. Yeah. That guy, that uh, that blonde guy, ginger guy, uh, was what was his name? Who was parading himself for, to be a Muslim for a very long time, and then he he gets baptized in a tub somewhere. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And what, yeah. What was his name? Yeah, smile yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, something yeah. is smile. Yeah. When, uh, look, this is what happens. Mm. So you don't put your trust as we were discussing about. certain individuals the other day and rotate yeah. for example yeah people were people are falling all over him and because yeah there has to be a balance you have to know yeah. your limits and everyone's human limits fine we're very happy we get happy when someone accepts yeah. islam so the difference so give them time the difference between these cases is andrew tate's always been big 
Yeah. 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 That Ismail fellow, he had he wasn't big by the way. He yeah, became he, made it, he, he yeah. became big after he left Islam, ironically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh that that girl, she became big overnight. Yes. And the problem was the community boosted her and were looking up to her. Yeah. They were looking up to her because um, maybe of maybe version. some Shia guys got to her and then Guys and girls, guys and girls. Guys are good. I, I'm, I'm not sure what happened to her now. She may have come back. Um, I think there were some rumors of that. But yeah, what what irritates me was that again you had this you know lay person who's just converted to Islam. People are asking fatwas. <laughs> was, uh, are you serious? Uh, uh, What's your yeah. opinion, sister? On you it's, know, it's an actual marrying shubha. a brother from India and sponsoring him. <laughs> so, so it's an actual so it, it has some benefit as well. There are people out there who are not practicing Muslim, non-practicing Muslims. Yeah, uh, yeah. And when they see something like this, they get inspired. But, but you see, so it's, it's an actual. But you shubha. know, online is so fake. Like anybody can, and if they and people look for these types of mm. little. There are fake. You know, yeah. you, you know what I mean. Fakes. Yeah. 100% that's the danger that's the problem there yeah. are people who are doing it for all sorts of things yeah okay people uh people i mean we have individuals doing all kind of funny things so there's a huge variety of people out there yeah. who would fake a shahada or fake yeah. a conversion well we were just talking about it the other night remember i was telling you that story mm. there's this brother um well a person claiming to be muslim mm. he, he came to this masjid and um so he was sitting and talking with the brothers and then the uh, sheikh comes up to me and said, I saw just like this, like a few days ago, this same person asking for money at a masjid in a different city, mm. right? And it seemed like he was getting ready to ask all these brothers for money, right? Again, and he claimed to be a revert. So he's a new re revert. And um, so I sit with him and I start talking to him and this is, by the way, this is a person in real life. So mm -hmm. in online, you can make it even more elaborate and give it, you know, a, a more of a better uh, picture of yourself. Yeah. So um, I sat like I so I sat with him and he had a, he hadn't made the ask yet. He hadn't made the ask yet, but you could tell he's kind of getting towards asking these brothers for money. And uh, so I just started asking him, him question. I said, oh, you accepted Islam? He's like, yeah, I accepted Islam. Uh, like, so, so what um, what brought you to Islam? Like, you know, what did you, you know, what, why did you accept Islam? Yep. He's like, oh, I just, I just love the religion. I'm like, oh, what do you love about it specifically? Yeah. It's like everything. He's like, no, but there has to be something, you know. And then he said, um, the Quran, right? Yeah. I'm like, okay, what exactly in the Quran like led you to Islam? Like, yeah. you know, I, I'm very intrigued to know about this, mm. you know. And he said, oh. Uh, all the verses, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm like, but there has to be like a. a have you read all of them? <laughs> have you read all of them? <laughs> I was like, I was like, you know, there has to be a specific verse. It's like, you know, I I can't choose one. It's just all of them, right? And then um, eventually, then he got to the ask. He's like, you know, to the brothers. Right? Mm. He's like, you know what? Um, I need to get. I need some money. If you guys can give me some money, I really need some money. And then so I asked him, oh, why do you need the money for? Right, all the brothers are so innocent. New revert, he's a white guy. They're like, oh yeah, mashallah. Like, oh, you love Islam, you love all the ayat. So they they don't understand the game that's being played, right? So then everyone else is highly supportive. I'm like the odd guy asking questions. So I said, oh, why do you need the money for? He's like, oh, I need to go to um, Montreal. I'm like, why do you need to go to Montreal, right? Uh, he's like, I need to go to Montreal so I can learn French. Like, why do you need to learn French? Like, you just accepted Islam. Wouldn't you want to learn Arabi, right? He said, you know, I'm so corrupt in the English language that I need to learn French first because then through French, I'm going to learn Arabic. <laughs> like, that is, that is some, this is some fancy footwork here. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking like thing. this, this guy in real life and then mm -hmm. these brothers, him saying that, no one blinked. Mm. I'm like, you guys are like the most innocent. And then you're talking about how, you know, even known du'at can get hustled. Yeah. Smart people can hustle. I'm like, we're getting hustled every day online with, For you know, sure. the way. Like, if somebody says shahada, say alhamdulillah, but why do you got to start following them? Especially if like they're, you know, they have an attractive profile picture, you know. That's true. 
Have uh, you come across the Mujahid story? Mujahid, no. Yeah, Mujahid, yeah, Sheikh. Mujahid from Australia, Medina student that passed away in a car accident. No, 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 what's oh, that? Uh, okay, so this is a reminders account. Okay. Australian student, um, this was big, big news on Twitter. Uh, reminders account, he's studying in uh, Medina Islamic University, passes away in a car accident. Before he's passing away, he was writing his final tweets, keeps on writing reminders. I'm, I, it seems like I only have a week left, or et cetera, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. I'm going to hand in my account to my teacher, to my friend or something yeah. to keep this uh, running. And then the guy passes away. Mm. And then the janaza is on Monday uh, after Maghrib in uh, the uh, Haram al Nabawi. Yeah, and uh, people went, and there was a body, of course, and all of that. Yeah, and uh, something was sus because people were like, "There's no mud- who's this a mujahid, Australian mujahid," mm. and because like it's this tight knit community in the university, but they don't know if this Australian guy called a mujahid. So w- we started asking. W- w- one of the claims was he was a student of Abdus Salam mm. So some some folks contacted Sheikh Abdus Salam, and he his reaction was like. Why do you folks keep asking me all this mujahid? I don't know any mujahid. <laughs> Soon after, around that time, an account popped up. We're collecting donations for mujahid mm-hmm. because we're going to open an Islamic library because his whole life was about Islamic knowledge. We would like donations so we could we could start yeah, and receiving books in order to yeah, they start this thing, sadaqa jariya kind yeah. of thing. And that was it. And, and then, of course, the person got exposed. There were, of course, people who died in Medina on Monday uh, at the Every Salah. Like, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. Know. Because you had people on Twitter saying, yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah but who was the person that was dead? <laughs> yeah. you know? Anybody who's been there yeah. knows how you know There's easy that would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. So, the, so, so here's how bad it was. This is the main point yeah. I wanted to get across. Yeah. You had people saying, like, girl accounts unfortunately yeah you know some some they were saying things like i was affected more more by mujahid's death than the death of my own father what? and stuff like that you had stuff like that occurring you know all this attachment to this random online personality yeah, and your own father that's yeah yeah that's ridiculous yeah. Subhanallah, this, where we got to Ustad, uh, like when we have like emotionally what's going on emotional damage you know like what's going on here <laughs> you know it's a mess but i think we need to have more conversations like this one yeah where people can actually be aware yeah these things are actually happening out there yeah so that people can uh and i, I think there's got to be some kind of counter culture movement like pr- like promoting in real life because until yeah. you like meet people in real life it's so different yeah you know yeah not look it happens i'm not until you're conned by a con man, mm. yeah. you don't know what a con man is. Yeah. Right? So we've been conned enough and uh, I think it's time to wake up yeah. and put some, process, uh, some processes and uh, some mechanisms in place to protect ourselves mm. against all these things we discussed today. Whether it's leaders, imams, their challenges, mm. whether it's fake shahadas, whether it's social media accounts popping up here and there, mm. asking for donations and things like that. I mean, I get so much on my Twitter yeah. and I just block them. I, I post something about, let's say, you know, some issue. And mm-hmm. then there's like a tweet underneath, mm-hmm. like my son is dying. Can you please help? And a lot of these accounts are fake. They're mm-hmm. fake. And they are, and, and, and thousands of people are being conned of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there has to be a mechanism. There has to be some way of uh, authenticating the, yeah. the source of these messages. Yeah. I advise every Muslim out there in the world uh, and every non-Muslim for that matter, to not make donations until you know for sure uh, and have confidence that the money is going to the right place. That's it. One of the solutions is Alim al-Hadith. One's attachment to Alim al-Hadith allows you to not accept something just because you like it. Exactly. Mm. That's it. That's the it, main it thing. Makes you, it makes you more savvy to criminality. Yeah. Because, because the Hadith collectors they considered liars and fabricators to be criminals. Mm. So they could suss a criminal immediately straight away. They were like detectives. Yeah. They did detective work. Yeah. They could even catch a word that didn't sound right. El mm. Muddaraya, you know? Mm. Uh, you know, they could, if they, they, if they saw a funny sounding word 
in the report. I mean, they even became such experts that they could even read a sentence and say, this is not the language of the Prophet Khalas. This is not even a sentence said by the Prophet ﷺ based upon the experience. Yes. Because this is not his language. Mm. They were so close to the Prophet ﷺ that they knew how he spoke. Yeah. You know, one uh, last thing I want to discuss, I, I saw this on the report, and I think it's also relevant um, for people who are involved in Dawah. Mm. And that's this uh, thing here about burnout. Mm. And um, most are going through um, medium to high burnout. And most of them experience burnout uh, a few times a year, right? And it's due to being emotionally drained, uh, being like kind of cynical towards the community, losing patience. So um, how do we avoid, Do you have you guys ex- experienced burnout? Let's uh, start with that. Have you experienced burnout? Burnout like, in Dawa. In Dawa, yeah. Have you, like we feel that we should not do it. Like you feel like like I'm burnt out, like I need to take a break or a vacation, like I'm just, you know what I mean? The only time I felt like doing that is when I want to increase my knowledge and and I just want to take a break just to go and study with you and fix my language and things like that. Mm-hmm. That's when I feel like taking a break. But other than that, I know there is nothing better than Dawah mm-hmm. for a Muslim. This, this is what the Anbiya were doing. Mm. This is what the Prophets are doing. And I thank Allah for continuing using us. Mm. And, uh, for continuing use, using us for, for this. And I don't think... If you, if you know the value of the work of Dawah, if mm. you actually truly understand what it means, you will, I don't think you will have a burnout. Mm. Because you know what, what, you, what you're getting in return. Mm. What your reward may constitute. So, so would you say on that note, mm. would you say... If you are tied closer to a salary to mm. that dawah, you're more easier, more likely to burn out. If you're doing it for for a salary, yeah. So, like, yeah. say for example, you were to take two samples. Mm. You take people who are primarily get their income from their Islamic work, yeah, and a, and people who do Islamic work but they don't get their primary income from Islamic work. Yeah. Which group do you think is more likely to burn it out? It could be either either side. Yeah, it well, depends. It's causing the burnouts usually, in, in the in the report does yeah, mention. So they're saying, um, uh, you know, emotionally being emotionally drained. It's kind of like even across uh, the board for people who get it a few times a year. So emotionally drained, uh, cynical towards the community, and losing patience. So, do you have do do you uh, get a lot of? Questions from patients um, that come to you and you're like, oh God, this is just like way too annoying. And does that burn you out? Not really. Like, I, I don't feel like I ever really get uh, like burnt out from patients. You know what I mean? Because um, I always put myself in their position. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I, for me, it's just like I take the time. I'll just explain it or I'll be like, maybe I got to just explain it in a different way. And I realize that most people are just I, I make notes of everyone. They don't no one keeps charts or notes of their own, you know, health. So it's like, you know what? It's fine. I have to just re- go over. I just did that today. You know, a patient. I went over the past 10 years. I said, OK, remember, we did this and then this and this, this. And I just went over the whole thing, you know, so. Yeah, I don't think a community should be the cause of a burnout. Yeah. It, it I think it's happen. intentions. Why people do. I feel my theory, if we're going to do an experiment, I feel that the people who get, and I'm not, again, it's not an indictment for you to get paid, mm. but it does have an effect on human emotion. There's been studies on this where they'll, they'll, they'll have kids and they get them to use a certain felt marker. Mm. And uh, so they see their their usage of that. Okay. And um, then they give them some kind of material reward. Their um, use of that certain type of marker will go up. When they take away that reward, it goes below the level that they started from. Mm. So it actually goes lower, right? And then another group that they do, that they just do it out of their own personal enjoyment, mm. right. it doesn't, it doesn't uh, you know, go down, yeah. right? right? So I, my, my theory, basically, you know, knowing on many of these behavioral studies, I think that has a, 
and, and, and in fact, it's not an indictment and it's a practical reality that we need to fund people yeah, even even even, but, even if it's not but i feel but i feel for example you know people say this i've seen this said many times and you can cr tell me if you agree mm. it's like they don't pay me enough for this mm. have you heard that before mm, not me okay i have i have i have, I have. you I know have. they they don't pay me enough to deal yeah. with this right whether it's with the community whether it's with like you know so many other things whether it's the board you know what I mean? in, in, in reality yeah. in reality Imams? Imams and du'at and yeah. speakers, uh, I would say in reality, no one can possibly pay anyone for da'wah, okay? It is so highly valuable that you cannot possibly pay. So you cannot make a monetary comparison in this. You can't weigh da'wah against money. It's Im impossible to do that, okay? Those who do that, clearly, they are the ones who have burned out. Mm. What happens is, once they don't get the money they want, and they 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 don't have the the incentives coming to them then they will eventually walk away mm. but people who are consistent mm. in dawah and dawah becomes their life and when and 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 if these people were doing dawah when they were poor when no money was coming mm. and then when while they were doing dawah and money started coming for whatever reason mm. okay these people I don't think they would have burnout because they and, they... and I don't think also, just to say, like, if you experience burnout, mm. um, also, I don't want to, like, uh, say that that's something that's uh, disparaging against you, right? Like, there could be many factors involved. So it's not like, yeah. oh, you're a person that you're just financially motivated. Sometimes yeah. burnout can be, you don't have support structure. Yeah. Like, everyone comes to you to ask you for something, but no one asks you, do you need something? You okay. know what I mean? So... Look, you know, that could be, you know, that could be your time. incentive in a good yeah. deed is not always a yeah. bad thing. Yeah. I'll tell you why. Even at the time of the Sahaba, when the Prophet ﷺ would go uh, to war against the tribe, a hostile enemy, uh, there was this incentive of booty. Mm. Anfal. This incentive was there. Yeah. The Sahaba did look forward to it. And at times when they didn't get it, they, they got upset. Like when Abu Sufyan and, uh, was, was rewarded after the battle of uh, mm. Banu Ghatfan, and then the Prophet said, would you not rather me be with you than this mm. dunya? And the Sahaba said, we are pleased with you, Ya Rasulullah. Yes. We have these examples. Mm. So it's not always a bad thing mm. to have, uh, uh, if, 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 as, 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 uh, as a motivational factor. It's not a bad thing. How about you, Free? Do you ever feel like, oh, I, I, I need to take a break from making videos? Like, do you? Yeah, it lasts, it lasts a day. Yeah. <laughs> it lasts a day. So it, it, when it's a really lengthy project, Mm -hmm. A really, really lengthy project. When I'm done, I'm like, I don't want to do anything. Halas, I'm done. Yeah. And then it's like one day, and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? I need to do something. I'm wasting so much time. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. No, but, but there's nothing better than this. Yeah. Because this is true legacy. You might be mm -hmm. changing lives. Something little, something like a like a short clip, may mm -hmm. may change someone's life. But you know, Ya Sheikh, what you're saying about um, Al Ansar. And the Ansar's acceptance of Rasulullah not giving them anything mm. and giving all the uh, booty to the uh, recently converted Quraysh. Mm. This, uh, this shows sincerity like no other. Absolutely. They just, w they just went through war mm. and then they were told, yeah, you know, it's going to Quraysh. Yeah, subhanAllah. Imagine yourself in that situation. It must be like a shock. And subhanAllah, today, if something like that happened to a lot of the um, du'at or imma that say things like, I'm not being paid enough, mm. something, something they probably just quit. Mm. But this is the Ansar we're talking about. This is the Ansar, they're not normal people. Plus they're dealing with the Prophet. So our du'at and uh, Imams are not dealing with those, that kind mm. of people. They are dealing with truly stingy, difficult to deal, hard-headed people. Mm. Uh, yeah, a lot of these uncles and and chachas and mamas who are running the masjids, mm. they are very stingy people. But you know, they, this is not only in, their moms. in Deen, you know yeah. that, yeah. like, you know, uh, around the s same time that uh, Wikipedia was starting out, mm. you guys remember Microsoft and Carta? I don't. Okay, so My, Microsoft was making an online encyclopedia, mm. but, but it, it, um, was something that it's Microsoft. Mm -hmm. So it's like they're, they're full-time employees, 
paying them mm. massive funding, mm. right? Wikipedia was like this project they were doing for free. Mm. Okay, so nobody's getting paid. Mm. Wikipedia blew Microsoft and Carta out of the water. Mm. And these people were doing it for free, mm. but the model, like the, the lesson that's showed is that they were doing it because they really believed in it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, now Wikipedia is always asking for donations. You know that. Yeah, yeah of course, of course, there's right? Always, like, there's when you go on Wikipedia, there's always something on top. I'm, I'm just talking about the the initial. So sustainability yeah, yeah. Is, uh, is is also yeah. another thing. Yeah. Now, if Wikipedia does not have money, it will yeah. collapse because yeah. it needs to pay people now. Yeah. So, um, I uh, believe. I feel like responding to something that was said earlier, Yashir. Mm -hmm. You said that the, the imams today they're dealing with folks that were stingy. Yeah. Um, They're very stingy, yes. The case of the Ansar is worse in the sense that they went through a war. Mm. It's all about their sincerity. No, no, but they knew they knew the Prophet's generosity. Mm. They had no doubt he, that he, this is the most generous man. He, he gave. He, he didn't give them anything. He didn't no, give them at anything. that point, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, but th but these same Ansar have gone through gone through so many battles and expeditions with the Prophet. Right. That they know how generous this man is. And but but, but yeah. you know uh, one thing I, I want to just add another dimension to this, if yeah. I may, that there is something beyond the monetary support that they had for each other. Yeah. Right. So it wasn't simply transactional. Mm -hmm. There was a relationship based on like this love, like the Messenger mm -hmm. of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam personally um, would inquire about the situation. Of different Sahaba and their condition, and if he didn't see a Sahabi, where is he? You know what I mean? So there was a care. So I want you to think about this: if we had that within our community, would the Imams burn out as much? Like, so for example, do you need something? You're having problems. Like sometimes, you know how it is. Uh, if you if you say something to your child, you know you'll tell them a ten, ten thousand times, but somebody else will say it. They'll be like, oh yeah, you know he was. I've been telling you this so many times. So you have like, oh, maybe the Imam's having problems with his child, getting him to do the right thing. Are you there to support, you know, the Imam? Maybe the Imam's going through a financial situation or a hardship. Does anybody most, care for free? Most. So there's a different, I feel there's also a different dimension because there's, you have that, okay, one monetary transaction, but the c constant like undercurrent yeah. was like there was a true ikhwa. Absolutely. and support structure Absolutely. if you don't have the support structure like for example you know we invite you and it's like i you know you need to do things fee sabila we don't inquire uh, for you how are you doing you're sick okay let me do something for you you know free like you know no, you, you, you need something you your need, he's you're in minus 40 let's get him a jacket or, do you understand what i'm saying so those not necessarily we're paying but it shows you know if we didn't do any of that care or concern say listen you just got to show up and do this thing fee mm. sabila you might burn out. You'd be like, okay, no, I can't speak. You know, no, you know what I mean? No, 100%. I'm telling you, yeah. the reason why I'm coming back to Canada to, on these hectic trips mm -hmm. is, is because of the love yeah. and, the, and the care we feel. Mm. I, I specifically feel that. And I'm pretty mm. sure everyone else is uh, also feeling that. Alhamdulillah, I okay. feel, feel the same way, yeah. especially Dr. Sayed, yeah. Dr. Omar. Alhamdulillah. I feel so, the love from you guys too. Yeah, no, so this burnout yeah. is real if there is that support structure is not there. Yeah. And I have seen this with my own eyes. I manage a lot of people in mm. Dawa yes. personally. And I've had cases coming to me where people are struggling with a number of things. Mm. I, I Sometimes I go out of my way to accommodate for their, their needs mm. because I want to retain them. Yes. If they are, if they are good brothers, mm. if they are good du'at, then in order to retain them, we have to show our brotherly love to them. Mm. Spend time with them, play with them. Yeah. For example, sometimes like I, I, I went to Africa mm. um, and we got the brothers together and we did like uh, tug of war with them. Mm. We did barbecue with them. We had swim with them. This is to build relationship. Okay, you now I decide your, your work is, let's, let's, come, let's come together and chill. And they loved it. Mm. They loved it. They 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 made they built a relationship with us mm. that I believe they would have regard for. Before leaving or before doing something, they would they would actually think of disappointing us. Mm. So burnout is delayed 
or prevented by these kind of measures mm. brotherly uh, activities uh, doing things uh, like you know we, i, I think we don't even really truly care about the condition we'll say you know kaif halak you know how are you doing things like that but you re- sometimes do you really care how the brother is doing like it's like everyone expects to say oh yeah alhamdulillah right mm. If someone says anything other than that sometimes people get uncomfortable <laughs> you know what i mean like well actually you're too much information oh you're going through this issue you know i'm having issue with my wife my you know my, this is hurting in my body and you know i have i have you know my car needs to get fixed oh i didn't want to hear all this or, you know what i mean do you expect me to help you with these things <laughs> right yeah yeah <laughs> i'll just make i'll make dua for you right yeah. but that's i think uh, no, but even, a, a even, significant even, that's a legitimate variable i think but even yeah. to give sincere advice sometimes advice to, and to, positive reinforcement exactly yeah. exactly sorry man i'm so sorry it yeah. happened to you yeah. i wish i was there to help you yeah is there anything i can do yeah you do something small yeah like send me i have to say you know uh stad farid uh he sent me uh, this thing out of nowhere um about um uh back remember you said, i forget what you, you sent me something Um, it was something I can't recall what it was. Yeah, I I, I remember. I'm like, you know, so hot. Wow, mashallah. He like, really? you know what I mean? Because when we were traveling, I was having some back issue we last year. Oh, this is one of his good yeah. characteristics. Yeah, yeah. And so he sent me he this has message. Many, he has many. He has yeah. many challenges, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he sent me books. Mashallah. Maybe, maybe I asked him passingly, and he yeah. would send it to me. In He's like, they're all lost. He's like, they're all lost. <laughs> I don't know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but I appreciate that you appreciate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, alhamdulillah. So, how was your back? Uh, alhamdulillah, you know, it's uh, because the nature of my, uh, mm. it's going to always be, uh, you know, an issue. Still but. an issue with lower? Uh, it's 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 better, okay. yeah. But it kind of comes and goes, depending on, it, it always will be tied with if I have intense, you know, consecutive days, yeah. then that's when it comes back. Have you tried vitamin D? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, wow. for your years, your years, yeah. We have to have it here. We barely get any sunlight, yeah, yeah, so yeah. you have to, yeah. yeah. Even that helps with immune system. Even Bahrain, we got, like most of the countries have got vitamin D deficiencies. Yes. Yeah, oh, really? Indoors, wow. Yeah. Because everyone's indoors. Yeah. Indoors, eh? That's maybe the yeah, reason. You're not getting any sunshine. Mm. And it, it has become a real problem. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's giving rise to a lot of other conditions as well. Yeah. Um, like it, it, because it reduces uh, your immune system. It, it mm. weakens it. Lack yeah. of vi- vitamin D yeah. uh, weakens your immune system, and that brings in a lot of other problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So every one must check vi- vitamin mm-hmm. D. That's that's usually the case. There. I think that's another important thing for the du'a is, yeah. you know, the the physical health has an effect on your mental. Like if you're physically going through a lot of uh, you know uh, aches and pains or weaknesses yeah. in the yeah. body, yeah. I, I've noticed that that sometimes um, that physical thing like. It's kind of like they tap out, like, okay, I got to take a break or I got to deal with the physical stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think on that positive note. Yeah, on that positive. So, Jazama Khair for this. Speaking we of physical. We by the haq. We die by the haq. We sleep by the haq. <laughs> <laughs> And when life You're not allowed to sleep here. Tune into, tune into, tune yeah, into you can't life sleep. haq. Do you, know, do you know the tagline? You know the how we sign off? That's it. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. You want to try it? I, I, I didn't have all night to practice like yeah. Sheikh, so. Okay, follow It's me. It's very easy. We yeah, live by the haq. Yeah. We live by the haq. We die by the haq. It's like talqeen. Yeah. We <laughs> die by the haq. <laughs> And when life is stuck. When, when life is stuck. Tune into life haq. Tune into that. Okay. It's, 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 it's so cringe. Takbir. When you, when you get me Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.